like to to uh, to dedicate this message to her. I, I hope that it will be of some encouragement, to her, and I hope that today's verse will be with her throughout her, uh, her college journey. Last time we looked at what it means to be uh, to live by God's words from Joshua one eight, and uh, what being mindful and successful means. Joshua one eight is an encouragement and admonishment that as we become mindful of God's words, we will become aware of God's mission. Our special missions aside, this mission actually refers to our whole life. Being successful is, is just to complete well what God has given us to do. Uh, we need the guidance of God's word and the counsel of his Holy Spirit. Uh, that's our meditation and prayer, which again centers on his words. That was Joshua 1 8. Today we move to, on to a similar topic on prayer. And the verse is the very well, me uh, well um, memorized Philippians 4 6 and 7. The verse reads Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, to present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Before getting into the verse, uh, let's have a warm up for the message by way of um, a light hearted illustration. Let's say we're talking about the, the very common subject of having a balanced diet, balanced diet. Now, if we approach this subject, we need an assumption that we know what the different food groups are. If you don't know what protein, carbohydrates, and fiber means, then we need to cover that first. Otherwise, there's no point discussing a balanced diet. The same goes for today's verse. Philippians was written by Paul. It is relatively light in theology and doesn't contain much, if any, controversial verses. So relax, we're not getting into anything complex. A main theme of the letter is our new life in Christ, or more generally still, our new reality in Christ. Here are some examples. Chapter 1 is on the reality of life and death. Chapter 2, on the reality of master and servants. Chapter 3, the reality of past and future, etc. So often, when Paul discussed a subject in Philippians, say prayer, it's not just the subject itself, but also its past, present, and future realities. And when Paul discussed something in Philippians, like prayer, it's not just on prayer itself, but also the past, present, future realities. And of course, right, we have this unique privilege of discussing and even living for our future reality because of our relationship with God who holds the future. Otherwise, we're just being superstitious. So go back to the earlier illustration. Our past, present, and future realities are the different food groups, so to speak. And the balanced diet is our relationship with Jesus. I need to bear this in mind for today. Our relationship with Jesus being something that we do take for granted sometimes, maybe not sometimes. Either way, let's revisit the verse in light of this relationship and see if it helps us to better understand the ideas. So let's reread, right? Reread Philippians 4, 6 to 7, right, with this in mind. Because we have a relationship with Jesus, do not be anxious about anything. Because we have a relationship with Jesus, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present our request to God. And because we have a relationship with Jesus, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in him. And thus the passage looks a little clearer now. Right. With the benefit of our relationship with Jesus, let's look into the verses. Do not be anxious about anything. What does that mean? Now, many of you are Sunday school teachers, and you have taught Dan, you must have said to him, do not do 
something, something at some point. Joe and I have to say it all the time. Why? Do not presuppose that we are already doing it. I never have to tell Dan, do not launch a nuclear missile. But I do have to tell him, do not leave the table until you're finished every meal. And we all know why, to both. So do not be anxious, presupposes that we all get anxious. Why do we all get anxious? And this perhaps is where the idea on our relationship with Jesus makes all the difference. We get anxious because we are inadequate on our own to handle all the uncertainties that we face. We get anxious because we are inadequate on our own to handle all the uncertainties that we face. Now forget the notion that we can be so spiritual that we would never get anxious. Forget that notion. I'm quoting God from Ezekiel, slightly out of context, right? God said, even Noah, Daniel, and Job got anxious, right? So let's put aside any pretense that we could become so core spiritual to the point of being anxiety free. It doesn't exist. If it does, we wouldn't need a relationship with Jesus. So the first point is simply to acknowledge that we have needs, including the need to handle our anxieties. Having needs is human. We have physical, emotional, and spiritual needs, and none of us is able to meet them all on our own. Just take the most basic example. We all need food and shelter. What's Jesus got to do with our food and shelter? Well, he's our provider. Sure, he provides differently for each. He gave Abraham great wealth and the apostles relatively little. We don't know why, and Jesus never tried to explain either. What we do know is that Abraham's wealth did not meet all his needs, and the apostles did not lack. And the same goes for emotional needs. Some are better provided for others in areas like family, friendship, and different emotional resources. Yet all have needs and none is self-sufficient. It is not necessary to go into a long list of what constitutes physical and emotional needs. We all have some ideas what they are, even if we are not always able to be clear-minded about them. For example, in severe illness, different needs can get mixed up and it's not clear which is what, but the point remains. Before moving on, however, I do want to quickly, quickly cover one notable exception. We are discussing needs and anxieties where sin is not directly involved. If sin is involved, it is a completely different discussion. So say I'm swindling money at work. Of course, I'm going to get anxious. And the answer is not to appeal to Philippians 4, 6, and 7, but to confess, repent, and make recompense. I'm sure you all understand this. This message is not about sinning in peace. God does not entertain such nonsense. So the second reality is that we have needs, and many of them lead to anxieties. We are not to judge the needs, nor the anxieties. All that they remind us of is our humanity. This acknowledgement together with the understanding that the verse is established on our relationship with Jesus, should go more than halfway towards completing Paul's encouragement. Verse 6 reads, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Now that could just as well be paraphrased as, No that you are human and remember that you are in a relationship with Jesus. Know that we are human and remember that we are in a relationship with Jesus. Remembering that we are in a relationship with Jesus makes a difference to our prayer, petition, and thanksgiving. Imagine asking a stranger for help. We wouldn't do it unless we absolutely have to and the focus would be all about the help we need. 
Now imagine going to a good friend instead. The need remains, but the situation is different because of the friendship, and that difference is real. Jesus is our friend, so when we go to him, it's not just about the needs, it's also about our relationship. And it doesn't just apply to us, it applies to Jesus too. Jesus wants us to present our needs to him, and he wants us to remember that our needs are never more important than our relationship with him. Jesus wants us to present our needs to him, and he wants us to remember that our needs are never more important than our relationship with him. If you remember my suggested application from Joshua 1.8, it was to pray through scripture for one week. I stress the importance of scripture as much as I did the time frame of seven days or so and no more. We have needs and it would be a denial of our humanity if we were to ignore that in our prayers. Do pray through scripture because God loves to hear us use his words. Equally though, he listened to our needs like a friend. So do present our needs to him. Just remember that the listener on the other side of is the Lord Jesus who calls himself a friend. And at this point, things get a little subjective and it's fine that it does. You treat a friend different from me and likewise how we feel about them. Jesus is not looking for cookie cut models from us. As long as we remember that he is our Lord and friend and with equal emphasis on both, it's fine. We need not copy each other. Not only can we be a little individualistic, Jesus also responds according to the nature of our friendship too. And that takes us to verse 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus doesn't say he'll answer our needs, but he promised he'll give us peace from anxieties. To those who are not familiar with Jesus, this is the ultimate cop-out. We ask for our needs and he responds with giving us peace. What sort of an answer is that? Again, we have to go back to that premise that we have a relationship with Jesus, that he is our friend. If we remember Jesus as a friend, we might recall a few things he has said. For example, in John 16, 33, he said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Peace has always been Jesus' promise to our troubles and needs. It doesn't mean he's powerless about everything else, quite the opposite as he has overcome the world. But it does mean he doesn't always address our needs the way we present them. There are many reasons for that. Maybe we don't know what we are asking for. Maybe he knows better. But above them all is what he actually promised. He promised peace and as his friend, we should take heart in this. And we should ask ourselves, is Jesus our friend because he answers our needs? Or is he our friend because he saved us? Now, this is not to pour cold water on our needs. We already saw earlier that having needs is human. And we, need, we shouldn't judge ourselves or others for having needs. We only need to guard against not letting our anxieties overwhelm our friendship with we don't need to judge our needs or others of having needs. We only need to guard ourselves, not letting anxieties overwhelm our friendship with Jesus. And the best defense against that is his peace. This should be encouraging, that God isn't giving an abstract or obscure answer to our needs. Rather, he is putting our relationship, God is putting our relationship with him first and giving peace is his way of showing that. We can ask ourselves, given 
that God is almighty and he is showing through his action that our relationship is first and foremost. God is so showing us through action that our relationship with him is first and foremost to him. Right? How might he respond to our other needs? Now the pitfall here, of course, is to try and manipulate that relationship into something like Santa Claus. But I'm sure you're all too mature to do that. So using again our relationship with Jesus as a basis, let's think about how Jesus' needs were met. Jesus needed to be born. So God found him Mary and Joseph. Jesus needed protection as a child and young man. So God put him in Egypt and then Nazareth. Jesus needed to prepare for his three-year ministry. So God sent him to the wilderness. Jesus needed men to work with him. So God found him the 12th, ranging from a terrorist to a tax collector with a few fishermen in between. Jesus needed people to start the church. So God sent him seven more besides the twelve, six of whom we know virtually nothing about. These are all well-recorded events or characters in the Bible, and you can look into them, into all of them or some of them, on your own. Without even doing so, we know that each of the needs were met in an earth-shattering way. Mary and Joseph were such amazing parents that they also raised James and Jude, who became authors of the New Testament. Nazareth was such a brilliant location that at least eight of the 12 apostles came from there. And the 12 and then the seven were so faithful that they became the foundation of the early church. And everyone who followed Jesus since, including us, have them to give thanks to. You know all this, pages from church history that many find interesting. But that's not the point, not at all. We begin today by seeing that our relationship with Jesus is the basis of our faith. And that although everyone have needs, and needs do bring anxieties, none of us have to stay that way. Our relationship with Jesus means that his peace will displace our anxiety. Now, is peace just a painkiller that gets rid of anxieties? Sure, peace feels much better than anxiety. But is that all that God is doing? Just soothing our discomfort? Our relationship with Jesus should enable us to know him a little bit better. And through that understanding, we might realize that how God met Jesus' needs 2,000 years ago would have caused people anxieties back then as well. Do you think Mary was cheering inside the manger as she gave birth? The benefit of history and our relationship with Christ is that we are now able to see what seemed inadequate or even desperate back then all turned into historical pillars that built the church and the kingdom. And if we're still unconvinced, can we think of a better way for the gospel to reach us today? This is not to use grand historical perspective to trivialize our needs. Our needs are not trivial, for even back then, Mary needing a place to give birth was also very much just an everyday event. Rather, it is to remind us that because we cannot always think in historical terms, let alone in future terms, we won't comprehend God's response, even if he was to explain it to us, us each and every time. That's why he sends us his peace instead, as assurance and encouragement. But before we close, I want to touch on a double-edged application what are we to do when we see each other's needs? As James reminded us in James 2.15, suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you say to them, go in peace, 
keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. If we see a need and we have the means to meet it, let's not hesitate. If we lack some of the means and the setting is appropriate, let's pull together our brothers and sisters to meet the need. We should not get wishy-washy with ideas like, let's wait and see what God says, because the starting point is we already have a relationship with Jesus. We should have some idea of what he wants. He is consistent. But there are times when the needs are so complex that we don't know how or even where to start. What are we to do? I hope through today we can see that prayer isn't some rituals of last resort, but rather a reminder and reassurance that God is at work so we can be at peace. And peace won't come until we start praying. I have a few brothers in my life with complicated needs. One of them once faced unemployment, divorce, cancer in the family, and relocation at the same time. It's not easy to comprehend just how desperate he was. For three or four years, I've been meeting with him for weekly prayer. At first, we both thought praying was just a good way to engage with a friendly face and nothing more. The situation seemed hopeless. And I wish I could say that by now, everything is fixed. Not quite. What changed is that we both saw God. Sometimes quickly and other times slowly. But God is definitely there. And through it all, we experience peace that cannot be experienced in human terms. Because it only comes from relationship with Jesus. Putting our relationship with Jesus first in our prayer is not a delaying tactic to getting answers. It is in fact the key to seeing some of the answers. I admit it's only some of them, others we might see later or even never see, but the point is we pray. The more complicated the needs, and even if to the point of knowing what to pray for, Let's pray all the more with others. So in closing, may I encourage everyone to try something for a week. Again, it's just, it's just a week. right? It might disrupt your habit a little, but it shouldn't be in a bad way. Echoing Philippians 4, 6, and 7. In this coming week, try closing our prayer with, we pray because of our relationship with Jesus, instead of, in the name of Jesus, we pray. I suggest this not to upset tradition, but only to remind ourselves for a week that our prayer is established on our relationship with Jesus, which should both define and change the what's and how's of our prayer. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We pray because of our relationship with Jesus. Amen. And God bless.